Hi, I'm Scott McGuire. Thanks for joining me in my Backyard Sustainability Garden Series. I want to start out today talking about tools. Because before we get into any of the gardening techniques, we got to have a common language about the tools we use. Now, the best gardening tools are simply extensions of your hands. Your hands are the first gardening tools, so you ought to have some kind of gloves or something to protect your hands. Now, every other tool that you use ought to be considered an extension of your hands. So I want to start out with the first tool, the most important tool that I think you should use in the garden, and that's called the fork and spade. This is the most important tool in the whole entire garden, no doubt about it. Every time I need to go and do just about any task in the garden, this is the tool that I reach for. Now I know you're thinking it looks like there's two different tools. I know most people say, well, that's a garden fork and that's the garden spade. But I got to tell you that these are one tool because every time I've gone to the shed to grab one or the other, I've always ended up needing the one that I didn't bring. So I've forced to conclude after about 30 years that this is half of the tool and this is the other half of the tool. And that as if they were married, man and wife here, they need to stay together. So here's what happens is, I bought an apple tree. So I want to go out and dig a hole for the apple tree, all right? So I'll go and grab my spade, and I'll go out there, and I'll dig a hole, and I'll find all these rocks in the bottom of the hole. So, okay, I've got to go back and get the fork, and dig in the hole and loosen up all the rocks with the fork. I should have grabbed them both to begin with. But then the very next day, I'll have to go turn the compost pile. So I'll go and I'll grab the fork and I'll just go tr start turning the compost pile and I'll get it almost done. And then there's all those last little pieces that'll slip through the fork. And I go, oh, wish I had my spade because then I could scoop up all that loose debris and pile it all on the pile. I'm amazed it still happens, but these, this is the tool that you need to have to really do most all the garden things. And it would be a big mistake if you looked up in the catalog and saw that even though the gardening spade has its own number and the gardening fork has its own number and they're sold separately, you really shouldn't buy them separately. Do yourself a favor and get yourself a fork and spade. Make sure it's really well made, okay? You want to make sure that it's solid socket construction. This piece of wood here goes all the way down inside this steel. And all this steel here is one solid piece of metal. This tool cost about 50 or 60 bucks, but this tool will last me a lifetime. I've used this, in, this tool, in fact, for over 20 years. I've only owned two or three of these. And it's not because I wore it out, it's because I like to have a backup. Sad to say, tools of this quality are not made in America any longer. Um, but I recommend you importing wherever you can find it, the highest quality solid socket steel tools you can buy. I also like the D-handle, what's called this here, the D-handle, because it's a whole lot easier to use when your tools have a D-handle. When you're holding them like this instead of like this, it helps the strength of your arm come straight through on your wrist on the handle. Instead of having it this way, on a lot of long-handled tools, your wrists end up getting a lot more stress than they should otherwise. When you have a D handle on your tool, you're able to get a lot more strength and a lot more control behind it. Now the reason the spade is really great is because it has this square edge to it. You keep this sharp and it's like a steady blade. You can cut open sod pieces, you can skim away weeds and things, you can even use it to uh, cut out plants, perennials, from moving them. The square shape of the spade, believe, end, it ends up being a lot more useful, a shape, in and around the garden. Now, a lot of people don't have a garden spade. They've got a shovel. And it's usually one of these. It's a round point shovel. And a round point shovel with a long handle is a great tool for construction. It's a great tool for digging holes but it's not the greatest tool for the garden, um, especially a long-handled one. When I need a round point shovel, I like to have the D handle, and then I can use it kind of like a spade because I end up using it more like a scoop. But the truth is, the point doesn't really work. I like to have the 
flat edge of the spade most often. Now here's a broad shovel that I really like. It's got the D handle, but it, and it has the flat front, but it doesn't have a sharp edge like a spade, so I can't really use it like a cutting tool. But it really works as a scooping tool. When I need to scoop something and throw a large amount of uh, some kind of manure or compost or something, this shovel works really well as a scoop. Now if I'm scooping some really light material, some really light fluffy compost, and I want to get more volume at once, well, then I'll use what's called a grain scoop. Now a grain scoop is a really big scoop, and you can't really use this for materials that are that heavy. You only want to use the grain scoop for things like grain, really lightweight things, things that will be able to get a big amount of and shovel a lot of it at once. All right, so let's talk about rakes. In the garden, there are two different kinds of rakes. There's the leaf rake that you use for raking up leaves and grass clippings and lightweight things. And then there's the soil rake or a landscaping rake. It's a heavy metal rake that you use to uh, push soil around and shape beds and things like that. So the leaf rake, I often like to use a bamboo rake. Uh, it's the most inexpensive of the leaf rakes, really. Uh, bamboo is a lot better than plastic because the plastic is going to degrade in the sun and get brittle. So plastic rakes never last more than a season or two. You can get bamboo to last a little bit longer. The problem with most bamboo rakes, because they are inexpensive, isn't the rake so much as the handle. See, a lot of times these pine handles are kind of skinny and they're kind of weak, and so if you start bearing down on the bamboo rake, it's much easier to snap the handle than it is to hurt the rake, I've found. Like that's what happened with this rake, which is a pretty stout rake. It's made of metal. It's got a reinforcement screw here and a nice spring back on it. But the skinny little pine handle that was on this snapped like within a day or two that I was using it. So what I did is I got my own long stick, a nice piece of cherry wood, and I cut that stick to fit the brake and become a new handle. Now this handle has lasted for years and years, a lot longer than the original handle, and I know that if I keep changing handles out, a good quality rake can last me almost a lifetime, really much longer than the bamboo one can last. Now for soil rakes, I like to have a soil rake that fits the strength of the user. Now I often don't use one this small, a lot of people like might like a rake this small because they can control it easier and use it to rake out the surface of the soil. It's nice to have a, a flat back on it in case you really need to push it like a shovel. You can and then pull it back out with the tines. Here's another version of that one. Pretty common. This is called a tang that goes inside here and it, it's held together by this band. It's not the strongest method of construction. It's certainly not as strong as the solid socket construction we saw in the fork and spade. But it's usually strong enough to hold a rake together for the amount of work you're going to do in the garden. Lately though, my favorite soil rake has been the landscaper's rake. This big rake here, about 30 inches across, maybe a little more, I found a nice wide rake like this saves me lots of time in the garden because I can get long stretches of the bed raked out really nice and smooth. I just find having this extra width really helps make the raking out the bed chore very enjoyable. All right, so now let's talk about hose. So far we've talked about shovels and spades and forks and uh, rakes and all the things that we use to the real heavy soil working tools. Now let's talk about the cultivating tools. These are the more delicate tools that work across the very surface of the garden. Except for this one, we'll start out with the broad hoe. Now the broad hoe is a big honking piece of metal that sits on the end of a big stout long handle. Uh, the broad hoe is one of the few exceptions I make on D-handled tools because this is a tool that you really want that length of that the long handle there. 
Now because this hoe is so stout, the handle also has to be a lot thicker to be able to handle the stress. This hoe here is good for swinging away and chopping out big chunks of weeds. You use the weight of the tool as part of the force to chop the plants out of the ground. The best use of this tool is not to use all your muscle to chop away at it, but let the weight of the hoe do what it can. But I don't use this one very often. This is uh, usually uh, a tool that I use in really heavy weeded places where I have to be careful around some other plants. It's not used all that often in the garden. This is the tool that I use the most in the garden. It's called a hula hoe, or the oscillating hoe. And it's basically a band of metal in a stirrup shape. It's also called a stirrup hoe. And the stirrup hoe is a thin band of metal, and you sharpen it on both sides. So the cool thing about that is you're not only trimming weeds by pulling it, but you can also cultivate by pushing it. So essentially, you get double the amount of work from a hula hoe because every push stroke, you can get work done same as every pull stroke. Also, these little corners here are really great for working around the tiny places where you need to cultivate around your plants. I keep one of these sharp, and this is the tool that I use almost as much as the fork and spade in the garden. Now this is your more uh, conventional hoe. It's just a plain, uh, a plain flat hoe. I don't use this for cutting plants, for chopping plants so much. This type of hoe, I just use more as a marker. I just use this hoe to draw a line in the soil where I'm going to sow some seeds or something. I don't really try to do any cultivating work with this tool. It's got a cheap little tang here that I know would pop right out if I really wailed on this one. So this is kind of a lightweight tool that I really use more for a marker than anything else. Now here's a neat little hoe. This is called a collinear hoe. This was invented by Elliot Coleman, and it's a tiny, small little blade of a thing. You keep that sharp, but what's cool about that is it's set at an angle for you to work right above it, and you can cultivate at right above where you're working, just like a little blade. You're really like drawing a knife across the frosting of the cake, only it's way down there and you can stand up here. That's a great tool, the collinear hoe. I like that one a lot. And these kind of weeds, this big old hoe is perfect because the weight of the hoe just knocks them over. See, the hula hoe is really better for smaller weeds to slice them off when they're really small, like the blade. This has some weight, so when the weeds get bigger, you can just kind of punch them with the weight of this and the blade digs them out. It's kind of like a shovel in a way. A shovel you can swing. But you're still slicing. You're still pulling that flat plane of the broad hoe across and slicing the roots off underneath. It's such that you can bite off a bigger plant than you can with a smaller tool. Now I've used this fork and spade for a lot of years now, and it hasn't always looked this well used. When it first came in the mail, my fork and spade looked like this. Pretty brand new, nice green paint on there, and all the wooden handles of tools that you buy anywhere are gonna have this layer of shellac on it. They're gonna cover it with this sealant to protect the wood in transit and for sales. You don't want to have that material on the wood with your bare hands trying to work with that tool. You get blisters and it doesn't help the wood any in the long run. So what I always do, as soon as I get a brand new tool or any tool that has any kind of sealer on it, I take a little sandpaper and get rid of it. Of course, if you have a power sander, a belt sander or something, a little hand power sander, it won't take that long at all. But even with a regular old piece of sandpaper, you can 
go ahead and sand all that varnish off, get all that shellac off of there, and get down to the bare wood, okay? Now you don't want to leave that bare wood. What you do then is take a little bit of linseed oil, and just rub that linseed oil into the wood that you've just sanded. You do that a couple of times, you let the linseed oil soak into the bare wood, and then every time you use that tool, the oils off of your hands will soak into the wood. If the wood dries out, maybe it needs another treatment of linseed oil every couple of years. But if you don't leave your tools out in the rain, and you put them away fairly often, then they'll get away with the coat of linseed oil a couple of times, and that should take care of it. The next thing I want to talk about in taking care of your tools is making sure to always keep a sharp edge on them. I'm always sharpening the edge of my spade to make sure that it has a nice sharp edge to slice through the ground, to cut through roots, to chop through sod. When this say, spade blade doesn't have an edge on it, I can really tell and it really slows down my work. It makes the work harder and not as fun. A nice sharp spade is a joy to work with. So here's how I sharpen it. I brace it in my legs like that, and I take a standard mill file, mill bastard file, and one direction. You don't drag it back and forth, it's just one time. Now only file one side of the spade. You don't want to flip it over and start filing this side because what will happen is you'll end up with a knife edge on your spade and that's a very fragile edge that will break and get chipped with rocks, things like that. So you want to make sure your edge is only on one side of the spade. It's not a very sharp edge in terms of a knife blade. It's just enough of an edge to give you that advantage cutting through the soil. And if you keep your spade sharp regularly, you don't have to do much more than that in order to keep a good edge on it. I also really like to keep an edge on my cultivating tools, my hose. So I'll take the same file and I'll File a few strokes on the blade of the hula hoe, right to the corners, because remember those corners are really good for hooking weeds out of the ground. So I want to make sure that's sharp. And then I also make sure I do the back edge as well. Because remember the hula hoe is a double bladed tool. It'll cut on the push as well as the pull. So you want to make sure that both of those edges are pretty sharp. I tend to sharpen the tool before I go out and use it, not when I'm done with it. But either way, you'll notice if it gets dull, and it's much better to keep it sharp. So now I'd like to talk about some hand tools. I don't use that many hand tools, but the ones that I do, I really like them. So I'll tell you about my favorites. This is a little hand cultivator. It's a little Japanese tool really fine steel. I can keep this blade sharp here. And this little tool is wonderful for hand weeding around tiny little plants. It's great for thinning, uh, for doing all the little tiny, I call it tweezer work. All the tweezer work in your garden where you're pulling with your little tiny fingers and you can't use gloves. This tool is great for that. Between your tweezers and this tool, you can get a lot of really fine, delicate cultivating done. And that's really the best time to get all the weeds done when they're as small as you can get them. Get them out of the way. Let your plants get big and then they can take over. You don't want to wait until the weeds are bigger than your plants. Then it's too late. And this is a tool to help you get right in there early. Now a lot of people use a trowel. Looks like this. You know, a standard. And there are many different designs for trowels. But I find that when I use a trowel over and over and over, it starts to bend. Usually they're just so cheap that I can't garden as vigorously as I do. 
and have a, a cheap hardware store trowel last very long on me. I really like this one here. It's a Japanese tool. It's kind of a cultivator, like a hoe, only you can throw it in the ground and pull it, and it opens up a perfect little hole for transplanting. So in a way, it's kind of like a transplanting trowel, but it also comes off the handle. It's kind of cool. I really like this tool a lot. The Japanese make really wonderful hand tools. Super high quality, they last forever. But sometimes, the best hand tool doesn't even come from the world that, of tools that you're in. My favorite trowel is a masonry trowel. Masons use this kind of trowel to uh, put masonry cement across bricks, things like that. I love this trowel for gardening because it's flat. I can use it like a knife. It can carve out little holes in many different grips. And I can also do a lot of other different functions around the, the little tiny plants with this tool. It fits right in my back pocket. So I was thrilled to find a, a masonry trowel that works as good in the garden as it does for any brick worker. It's important to have a good saw. I like one of these folding saws because you can have a sharp blade on it and you can tuck it out of the way right away and have it in your back pocket. On those times of year when I'm doing a lot of pruning, I use my clippers a lot, but I'm always wanting to have a saw for those branches that are just a little bit bigger. So I find that having a nice little folding saw in my back pocket usually does the trick. The other good thing about this saw is the skinny blade can get into tiny places. A lot of times a branch that you have to cut is not going to allow you the most access of a really big saw. So having a small blade like this can get into tiny places, can really allow you to make some delicate cuts. Now my last two tools here are some Japanese harvesting knives. They're called common knives. This is a plain sickle-like knife that is good for chopping grasses and harvesting. And its cousin here has a serrated blade, which is great for uh, harvesting lettuce, uh, cutting down weeds, all different kinds of things. Uh, harvesting, cultivating, weeding. Uh, some of these Japanese knives, they're not that expensive, and they last a really long time. I love having these in my toolbox. But of all the hand tools that I use in the garden, there's one hand tool that I use every single day, and that's my clippers. I use the Felco brand because they're Swiss made, they last forever. A lot of cheaper brands will last a year or two, but a pair of Felco pruners will last you really most of your lifetime. You can take them apart, you can sharpen them, you can clean them. They've got new parts. Without these, there's not a lot of things you can do in the garden. I carry parafelcos on me pretty much every time I go out in the garden because I can't be out there five minutes before I'm reaching for them. If I don't have them there, I just have to go back inside and get them. So I always make sure they're attached to my hip before I go out in the garden at all. I carry uh, the clippers with me every single day. Because even though gardening is a very nurturing craft, you need a tool of destruction to cut away all the dead things, all the dead flowers, and all the browned out leaves. The clippers is what allows you to move away all the dead and ugly things so the green and beautiful things in the garden can flourish. Now this big old 14 inch file is really good to have for most all the larger tools. But I also find it handy to have a little smaller one for the smaller hand tools. My Japanese weeder here, it's important for me to keep an edge on this tool just as much as the spade because this tool goes really fast when I'm able to slice the little roots. Oops, wrong side. This is the side I want to do.
Now, believe it or not, I've got one sharpening tool even smaller than that, the pen style. This is a little diamond steel, looks like a little pen, but it works great for your clippers because you always want to keep your clippers sharp as well. This has a little flat side on one end of it. And all it takes is a few little strokes now and then to keep that edge on your clippers. If you do this every so often, you'll be amazed at how fast all your chores go with this tool. Now one of the most important tools in the garden is the tool that you use to carry the tools into the garden and everything else. All the plants, all the soil, all the compost. You need something to carry these things around all the time and I like the wheelbarrow for that myself. The problem with the wheelbarrow is you need to have some strength. You really need to have some good strength in your arms because it's kind of a cumbersome sort of load. Now you can get wheelbarrows with two wheels and those are a lot more stable and they're a lot easier to maneuver. But the problem with a two-wheeled wheelbarrow is that you can't roll it down the pathways between your beds. It's hard to have raised beds and a small little pathway with a big wide two-wheeled cart. Now I've had carts in the past that have been able to straddle my beds. You know, the big uh, garden way cart with the bicycle wheels on it, those carts are great for a really large garden, some place where you want to pull a lot of material through there where a wheelbarrow might wear you out. But so, there's a trick about the wheelbarrow that I found that changed my life forever. And that is in the tire. Now your tire, if it's a tube tire, then it can go flat. And if you've ever tried to change a flat on a bicycle tire, it's a whole lot easier to change a flat on a bicycle than it is to change a flat on this tiny tough little wheelbarrow tire. So what I found was, Getting a solid tire, a non-inflatable tire, it's a little bit heavier, it makes for a little bit uh, uh, harder load, because sometimes when you have air in the tire, it, it's easier, it bounces a little bit, but you never have it going flat on you. You never have that thing where the tire mushes out and you can barely carry the load. A solid tire never goes flat, and that's why a solid tire gets my vote for the wheelbarrow. So we've talked about a whole lot of different tools today. Um, and it might be overwhelming the sheer number of tools I talked about. But I want you to know that if you just had a fork and spade, a hula hoe, and a garden rake, you'd be set. That's about all you'd need to get a really good garden started. As far as hand tools, if you had a good trowel and a good hand cultivator of some kind, those two hand tools could be just about all you need for your first season. These tools are enough to get you started, and you may find that other specialty tools can help you down the road. But I would recommend getting the highest quality tools that you possibly can. Now when it comes to solid socket and D-handled tools, you're going to have to mail order those. They're just simply not available here for the quality that you're going to want to have. Now one place to find quality tools that you might not expect are in flea markets, and yard sales and auctions. A lot of times, really solid old tools go up for hardly any money at all. And now's a really good time to be collecting high quality hand tools wherever they show up because they're gonna be really valuable in the days ahead. Well, that's our tool segment. I look forward to putting these tools to work in the rest of our Backyard Sustainable Gardening series. Thanks for joining me.